Hi everyone, hello, hello, hello. My name is Bryant Francis, a contributing editor at Gamasutra.com. Um, we are here today playing a little game called The Shrouded Isle. Um, down in the lower left hand corner you will see two wonderful faces as always. Um, one of those faces is a recurring face, Alex. You're the recurring face, who are you? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Alex Waro, an editor at Gamasutra. Dot com, the internet's first, best, and only uh, website. It looks like it was made in 1997. And we are, more importantly, uh, joined by a very special guest today. Uh, my friend, would you please introduce yourself and tell the audience uh, what you do? Hi, uh, my name is uh, John Wu Kim from Kitbox Games. I was the designer and programmer for The Shrouded Isle. And that game uh, is brand new. It just came out, and you were just telling us uh, over the weekend that you got a lot of sleep. Right? Yeah, I mean, uh, finally, yeah, I'm not jittery anymore or panicking or anything like that. Finally, I'm just like at peace with myself. Mm. You're at Brian, I think this game is not really about peace at all, right? No, it's about uh, it's about a lot of murder, or it will be about murder, sacrifice. Um, so this is the Shrouded Isle. It is a cult simulator from Kit Fox Games, makers of Moon Hunters and Shattered Planet. Um, I've been keeping an eye on this for a while because uh, I was interested in how, it, um, just in kind of like this very macabre simulator where you're trying to keep, uh, you can see down here on the end, lower end of the screen, like, you're trying to keep your village's uh, fervor, ignorance, discipline, obedience, and penitence up while managing the personality traits of your various advisors, uh, all these poor saps, one of whom is sacrificed at the end of each season. Um, Zhang Wu, could you sort of tell us where where did you all start like making this game? Why did you start making this game, and why did you think the world needed a game where you played a murderous cult? Wow, that's uh, quite a loaded question. Um, I'll begin by saying that uh, this was part of um, this began as a game jam project for uh, Ludendar Thirty Three in two thousand fifteen, and the theme of the jam was uh, "You Are the Monster." And uh, when we were uh, brainstorming concepts for the jam, uh, we looked at you know having a, just a literal physical monster. Uh, but we decided that uh, what's much more interesting is someone who is monstrous, like someone who is morally monstrous, someone who's an administrator uh, that does terrible things for reasons beyond uh, the average person. And so that's why we came to the conclusion that the player should be someone who serves a darker power and not the not a darker power himself or herself. And uh, it kind of uh, rolled from there. And so like uh, the game jam entry was called The Sacrifice and it was a very, very limited. Uh, probably the, the main common elements are the visual style and the, uh, and the, the fact that you uh, have a ritual sacrifice uh, at the end of each season to a slumbering dark god. Uh, but since then, um, it's uh, gotten attention for uh, uh, the theme, uh, gotten attention for the art style and so forth. And uh, we decided to expand it to a full commercial project. And so uh, one of the things we did was, uh, for instance, uh, move away from the physical resources that we started with, uh, which were like food and shelter, and decided to go full on towards what a cult leader would care about. And so you'll notice, like as you mentioned earlier, uh, the five uh, resources of the game are all spiritual. Uh, you want to raise the ignorance, the fervor of the village, because that is what your religion values in this game. So uh, something that stands out to me in this game, having played all of maybe one or two matches so far, because uh, it just came out, is like how it abstracts the and sort of like. Um, how it abstracts evil and makes it a very banal, like tedious workmanship like um, process. Uh, and so I, I sort of wanted to, I know I know it's like a big nebulous thing to talk about, but I kind of want to dig into this idea of trying to um, like give give players a reason to be basically an evil bureaucrat. Right. Uh, uh, like, tell me a bit more. Like, how did you how did you balance that as you were putting this together and like trying to figure out like. Okay, well, we need a house that ha that manages like uh, how to, like for, just to start with, how did you come up with the five different um, virtues, right? Discipline, fervor, obedience, that kind of thing. Um, part of it was that um, very early on, we had um, ideas for these uh, five great families of the town, mm -hmm. and uh, we felt very strongly about the maintaining that as part of the core experience, and. Um, 
And so we wanted to make sure that uh, that everyone, like you felt a need to carefully balance things. You felt a need to keep the Cadwalls around. You felt a need to keep the Yosefkas around and so forth. And, and then once we dug deeper, uh, we ended up looking at um, like a classic, uh, you know, like seven deadly sins versus, you know, the, the seven virtues and slowly crafted something that is like, feels somewhat familiar, but twisted, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess now that you bring it up, like four of these five virtues could very well be like, depending on where you are in history and, and where you live, like pretty much everything here except ignorance is pretty widely accepted as like a like a, like a good thing. So I guess right. it's interesting now that I reflect on uh, how close I came last night to uh, summoning the dark god. Like, it's it's not so bad, really. Like, I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm still trying to like turn this over in my mind how I feel about playing this game because um, and something we can touch on in a design sense is like uh, I I don't recall there being a lot of explanation about what's going on or why like booting into the game it, it has a very like uh straightforward uh opening it tells you who you are what you're trying to accomplish and how you do it and then you just get into it but you don't really get a lot of explanation about like why it's important that people be ignorant or why it's important that they you know be penitent or whatever and like i kind of want to um ask you specifically how did you how did you test and and find the um accessibility of this game right like you might call it onboarding like uh, did you give a lot of thought to how players come to this game and how they learn the systems or was that not really a, a big priority during development i'll admit that it wasn't the um, highest priority in development but it definitely was uh, um, was a recurring issue uh basically people would you know like approach the game from like uh, their uh, their personal values or like a more commonly held values and like so like the, the most common example is as you mentioned ignorance uh that players will often uh, approach the game in such that uh, hey uh, you know i should probably suppress ignorance right and then they see a warning as they uh, suppress ignorance and there's a there's a moment um, i find with new players uh, that like their um, mentality switches there there's a moment where it clicks in that uh, oh all of these all of these are valuable to me or to my organization, but not necessarily to the average person. And and once that happens, I find that uh, players tend to embrace their uh, inner tyrant, uh, so to speak, and uh, they become far more ruthless. And so that's partly why um, there's a we try to avoid uh, more explicit uh, onboarding because that uh, mentality switch was an interesting moment that we wanted to preserve. Mm. Yeah, I mean, like basically that that sort of rambling question was was a polite way of me saying I didn't quite get this game when I started, but I I did figure it out and I got to the end uh, by the skin of my by the skin of my teeth, right? And like I, nice. I think it's really interesting digging into that idea of like um, trying to form an unspoken communion with your player by 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 designing systems and mechanics that are self-evident right like right. so all this is kind of confusing and, and kind of off-putting for most value systems but once you begin to realize like oh i need to get you, you see the little bars you realize i have to keep everything above these bars or they turn red and red is bad and yeah. you sort of come to see the, the the mechanics and what's important and what you're supposed to value and then you see how the different mechanics play against each other and it it, it sort of expands in your mind like this beautiful dark flower into this uh, oh, like goodness. full game and uh, I don't know I think that's really interesting the idea of, of, of teaching players implicitly rather than explicitly uh, I don't Absolutely. know Brian, Brian did, you have, did you have any similar experiences when you were playing through it? Uh, I wasn't actually confused I sort of bought into the simulation really quickly but I guess um, uh, my, my question would be how do you uh, how do you like sort of when you make a game that like it's weird when we say a game that normally challenges people's values we talk about like extremely hard to make decisions in the context of a larger narrative but this game sort of sets out you sort of enter with the idea that you're going to be doing some screwed up things um how did you approach like questioning players values as a designer and how did you sort of like bring them to the point where they'd be making some rough decisions that's a difficult question. Uh, let me just think about it for a moment. Sure thing. Um, I'll uh, I'll just get 
this no pressure. next season going right here. I'm trying to <laughs> yeah, right. raise ignorance. So we're this will be. I need to see if I can make it past this season because I failed to so far. All right. Yeah, I. Uh... I was, I was so sad. I got to the end of this game last night, and I was like, I did it. I made it. I made it. Right at the very end, one of my houses turned rebellious, but I was like, no, it's fine. I got it. And then the guy <laughs> didn't come, and he abandoned me. And I was, I was, I shouldn't have been sad, right? Because the, these are, by all, uh, by all appearances, this is a village of ignorant, like relatively, like, uh, uh, like closeted, potentially evil people, and they had to go out into the world and like make their own way because their god had abandoned them. But I was really sad. <laughs> I was bummed. I was like, come back. Come back. Come back. I, I, I still love you, kind of. Um, so, so the question, Bryant, was um, how do you get the players to uh, buy into the value system of the town? Is that approximately right? Or yeah, yeah, is it more than that. I, I think it's just bit by bit. And like to a certain extent, uh, the, um, the UI itself but uh, as Alex mentioned earlier about like uh, things turning red and red like you know, stereotypically being bad um, and you know in context of this game uh, directly associated with the blood splatter uh, helps uh, reinforce uh, what is what you should be valuing um, but it, it, more broadly um, I'm not sure that uh, what we've done here is the best uh, example of like um, of like let's say like subtly get, getting people to buy in because I mean like I, I'm reminded of like people's complaints about uh, what's it uh, spec ops the line um, and how you know like of course like you know the player ultimately you know like does all these horrible things uh, but the, the only option not to was to turn the game off which is a uh, which is arguably a meaningful option but I mean like even in context of this game there was a moment in development where. There were a lot of demands for, hey, uh, you know, why do I have to sacrifice uh, people? You know, what if, uh, you know, we just, you know, what if there was an option that, you know, you don't? Um, and I had that in there for a while. Um, and what I found was that players generally did either didn't, didn't click it or um, the outcome of that choice was just generally dissatisfying uh, to the players. And so, I, I guess, like in terms of like self critique, like I, I do believe I could have done a better job of uh, like a uh, respecting player agency and getting them to slowly buy into this universe better. Like I find like the way it is right now, the UI is very explicit about hey, uh, you know, this is what you should value, and the only way to disengage with that is to disengage with the game itself. So, yeah, no, that makes sense. I um, we got someone in chat mentioning that. Uh, just by the appearances, this game looks like it could sort of uh, devolve down quickly into very much like roll the dice and watch the bars move. And I just want to push back on that a little bit for folks who maybe can't see the full game from this, you know, brief snippet. Um, you know, after playing through a game or two last night, and Brian's played through as well, there is certainly like there's a lot of management involved in this game. I would, I don't, I don't know, John, what would you would would you call it a management sim or not? But like, <laughs> <laughs> it has bars and they go up and down. So I absolutely, guess so. Yeah. yeah. But there are there are additional mechanics, and we can get into later in the in the chat about, um, you know, like having to ferret out certain people. Like like there is an implicit reward for ferreting out certain people at certain moments and there is a random event system that happens and there's a couple other things that kind of keep things interesting and give you reasons. They, they sort of disrupt the player's natural inclination to pick who would be best at a certain job and then tell them what to do to maximize a certain bar, right? There are reasons to raise certain bars that are, that are sort of outside the systems. Um, but before we get into that, this is a weird management sim. It's like a weird cult management sim with some cool art. Nothing like anything Kid Fox has done before. Yeah. I kind of want to talk about that, right? Like Kid Fox has done Moon Hunters and Shattered Planet, which right, are both sure. very different from this, I think. So tell me a bit about like what it's been like to work on that breadth of, of projects and, and sort of uh, I don't know, like like how did that how did that how does that work internally at the studio? Right. Um, so the circumstances for um, the development of the Shattered Isle is actually somewhat complicated uh, mm -hmm. because, um, as I mentioned, it began as a game jam project. Uh, what I forgot, uh, did not mention earlier was that the, most of the members involved in that original game jam were actually not affiliated with Kitbox in any way. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah uh, in fact, the, uh, the artist for the project at the time was um, 
And she was like employed full time as the developers of children's Zordi arcs, uh, Cardboard Utopia, who recently re released their game as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in that regard, uh, like it kind of shows that like why the art style would be so different because the the person who uh, who was driving the the, uh, the aesthetic vision was a different person than our uh, usual artists. Um, as far as um, how it impacted uh, development, um, a lot of the options that you know we would normally use to draw attention to certain things or um, to uh, uh, to uh, emphasize certain things are less uh, possible because uh, we've committed to this uh, very distinct uh, two-tone aesthetic. Mm. And so um, it, it's been challenging trying to figure out ways to uh, make sure that uh, everything doesn't blend together and know that this is important or like uh, um, this option exists even, you know? Or like uh, you might notice that, that we rely a lot more on tooltips in this game compared to Winantros or uh, Shatterplan, for right. instance. Yeah. Uh, I, I, hmm. So I, I was, just, I was gonna ask a question about tooltips, but I, I've had, I've had tooltips on the brain, which is, okay. <laughs> which is a weird thing to say, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But I, you know, I recently, uh, Pyre recently came out and that used tooltips in interesting ways. Oh my well. god, yeah. And that I just, game, uh, uh, that tool yeah, so go ahead. No, no, you should, you should do all the talking. I should just, uh, uh, I mean, that game is, uh, it's, it's pretty brilliant in the way how, like, they just use, uh, it's a weird new type of. I, I don't want to say new in case like someone else has done something similar before, but like it's it's a kind of an environmental storytelling like within that you know the wagon where you just hover over things and you get a sense of what everyone's up to or like what's new. It's, it's interesting. I, I love it actually. Brian, back me up on this. I am I'm all about storytelling tool tool tips. I love tool tips. I love. Uh, I don't know if you played uh, Jean. I don't know if you played Tyranny that came out late last year. Uh, but I have to bring oh. it up whenever we talk about tool tips. It does something that Pyre does as well. Which okay. Is like, it's it's the realization that like oh these these helpful this this system we have to help the player can be used as a narrative device. And right. uh, and here it's it's actually super helpful in Shrouded Isle because it's like like I said there's not really any. Uh, strong guidance about how the systems work early on, so you sort of have to rely upon like kind of ferreting out. Just, just as you're ferreting out, like people who are who are like bad, especially bad people, or actually like I guess they're good people sometimes, but they're bad people to you. Uh, you right. have to ferret out how the game works um, by sort of poking and prodding and everything. And I think that is again, like it's a very interesting uh, way of communicating with the player uh, implicitly. Uh, so. I didn't mean to talk over you. I'm sorry. No, no, it's all good. <laughs> but I mean, uh, one of the challenges with that, though, is of course um, the player like critical information and tooltips. Like, uh, for instance, uh, right now um, the main uh, way you can verify that hey, uh, this um, this uh, trait, uh, you know, being a pyromaniac, for instance, of what does it do is like a complete repository of that is through the tooltips. So, like, you know, you hover over the fervor. Uh, label and that's where you see it. Um, I think like you know, we could have, we might have been able to do a better job of like representing uh, critical information to the player um, in uh, in a way that's uh, more immediately visible to the, like. I've had cases where some players that uh, realize very very late in their first playthrough that hey, uh, there's actually really important information like embedded down here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I mean. At the same time, though, it's meant to be a replayable experience, and you know, like the the learning process itself, like you know, that initial experience, I think, is also very interesting and uh, you know, part of what the game should be, uh, the implicit uh, communication with the player, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah, and I think uh, it is uh, it's a harmonious piece of work in a way that, like, um, once you understand bits and pieces of it, that sort of like uh, uh, that echoes. And you can you can sort of understand the rest of it by sort right. of reflecting back, like, oh, okay, well, you know, I see why I want to spare somebody here. Uh, I see why this this thing is important. I see whatever, and like, I, it's I see why it's important to ferret out virtues and vices. And then all of a sudden, later in the game, you realize, oh, those are especially important to know. Um, so that's that's all really interesting. I think um, if we can, before we move on, I kind of want to sort of pick your brain about the art style a little bit more, if you can speak sure. to it. Um, I was impressed to look in the credits of this game. There are a number of artists, like as you mentioned, I assume people who. Um, or outside the studio, uh, and I kind of want to get a sense of, of where, you know, where the art styles, uh, influences, and inspirations come from. Um, probably the um, 
We were uh, we were very inspired by uh, Lovecraftian mythos um, when we were uh, uh, developing this game. Um, so a lot of the uh, the intricate uh, ornate designs of the game uh, they come from you know various uh, Victorian or Gothic ar ar architecture. Um, same same thing with the uh, the way the characters dress. Um, our artist uh, Erica, she uh, she's a big fan of uh, anime, so like uh, the, some of the visual, like a uh, character face facial design has like uh, some level of influence from that as well. Mm. I also want to know why you have a cellist and a, I think a violinist in the credits because that was really really cool. How did that happen? Um, our uh, composer and sound designer effects. Uh, uh, he really wanted to go all out with this uh, project. Uh, he really wanted to. Uh, uh, he really cares about the, the quality uh, about what he produces. Uh, so he insisted on doing a live recording, uh, the tracks and whatnot. So that's why I got there on the credits as well. Nice. Yeah, I hope it's coming through on the streams in some way. The music is uh, is really evocative. Uh, yeah. Brian, I, I'm I'm kind of just like kind of kind of just stomping all over here. Do you have any uh, burning questions? Yeah, I sure just have thing. to get out. Uh, Jong Wu, uh, could you kind of walk us through how you, as a game designer, think about simulations? Um, I know this is sort of the second, uh, like, randomized, like, sort of stat digging game that uh, Kid Fox has put out. Um, how do you personally okay. approach kind of these simulation experiences and making them more than just bars and numbers, like, uh, like Spawn Love was talking about before? That's a difficult question. Um, let me think. Ultimately, uh, it depends on whether the player's mental model is interesting, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, some players, you know, even as as is right now, um, will approach the Shadow Owl as strictly a bar goes up, bar goes down game. Yeah. Uh, but that's not an interesting way to play the game. That's not an interesting way to uh, experience uh, the game. Um, and so, Ultimately, for the at least as far as the Shadow Isle is concerned, uh, there needed to be a certain like central anchor, and in this case, it was the uh, the ritual sacrifice that just seemed like the most uh, compelling thing um, that we could wrap it around, and it kind of evolved from there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Shadow Isle is a bit different than most simulations because it's meant as like a, kind of a self-contained box. Like a lot of like builders or simulation games will spiral out by design, right? Like it'll you'll get more resources than you spend those resources, and then you know you can you know you get more stuff. Uh, whereas all the pieces in the shrouded aisle are just there uh, from the get go. You might not know what those pieces actually do at the start of the playthrough, but they all exist, and and so that changes how the dynamic works in this particular project compared to like other uh, simulations. Um, it puts a lot of uh, emphasis on like balance. Like if something goes up, something else must come down. Otherwise, the game can swing very drastically one way or the other over time. Mm -hmm. I wonder, have you uh, worked on anything else any way, in any way akin to this? Any other sim games? Any other management games? Or is this your first your first shot? I think this is probably my first uh, commercial shot at uh, a management game. Yeah. So that begs the question. Um, well, actually, first I want to know. I don't know. Maybe we touched on this right at the beginning, but it, it slipped my memory. Uh, how long was the production cycle on this from from conception to, to release? So uh, that's a tricky question because uh, this is um, never intended to be uh, a major project for Kitbox. Uh, mm -hmm. This was intended to be a side project, and for the most part, uh, the work that was uh, done for this project was done on a personal time basis. And uh, so, as I mentioned, the uh, the game demo happened two years ago. Uh, but the game mostly sat, uh, the, the concept just kind of sat there for about a year. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, I think uh, mid-2016 is uh, uh, when we decided to really focus on uh, getting a commercial release uh, going for this project. Uh, so part-time basis, about a year or so. All right. I, I don't want to let that, like mostly done on personal time comment slips. I'm gonna come back to that, but I asked sure. because I, I sort of wanted to know, you know, at the at the end of that, um, like, what have you learned? Like, if you could go back and, and tell yourself starting out on this project, you know, a year or so ago, two years ago, like, what have you learned about uh, the craft of building sort of like semi management games that you could maybe share with others to save some heartache? Okay. 
Um, and it, it, no pressure. It could just yeah, yeah, no pressure. Like you know, <laughs> craft the words of wisdom on the fly. You know. Yeah, just off the cuff. <laughs> yeah, um, just pull out your postmortem. You got it written on your palm. I know. What I would uh, suggest to myself in the past would be that be careful what you add. Hmm. Because complexity is not the same as depth, and and you know it sounds trite, right? Uh, because it is kind of trite. Uh, but uh, at the same time, um, I found that a lot of the time that I wasted uh, during development, if you will, uh, was uh, pursuing uh, certain like uh, features uh, that just seemed like a logical extension or a conventionally done thing, um, and then I wanted to uh, flesh that out too much rather than finding something that works for this particular project. And so it added uh, more, um, you know, knobs to twiddle with, um, but ultimately it didn't add to the core experience. And uh, to get back to what I was saying earlier about the, uh, the sacrifice uh, being at the core of this project, mm -hmm. uh, I think um, if I really emphasize that, emphasize that earlier in development, uh, uh, the guy would have uh, saved uh, some heartache, if you will, uh, over um, just the removing things that seemed interesting um, uh, on its own, um, but ultimately uh, did not really uh, add to the, uh, the fundamental experience of the game. Yeah, that makes sense. I um, I kind of want to dig into also, you know, now that it's out, you know, the, the actual like the sense, like the business of, of putting a game out like this. And I think that conversation starts with, um, you know, how you, you know, the resources you put into making it. So when, right. you, when you say it's mostly on a personal basis, like what does that mean? Was everyone working after hours for the most part, or is there a dedicated time with the studio, like a twenty percent time system? Like how did you, how did you and the rest of the team spend your hours on this project, and how were you compensated? Right. Um, so the core members of this project, the most besides myself and Tanya, so the uh, um, the artist, uh, the, sorry, the art director and the sound designer for this project are completely unaffiliated with Kitbox. In fact. Mm. Um, their only uh, connection to, uh, to us is uh, for this particular project. And so um, even myself, um, I, even though I am a co-founder of Kitbox and I, you know, I get salary from this company, of course, uh, all the work, sorry, I won't say all of it, but like a significant chunk of this work, uh, the work that was done here, it was expected that uh, it's done um, after hours, like over the weekends, uh, or like uh, during the evenings, and so forth. And ultimately, it proved to be untenable uh, because you know games gotta ship, um, and you know, you know, person has so much sanity, so to speak. Um, but uh, but that was the intent. And uh, otherwise, uh, Kitbox threw in a lot of resources. Uh, as, like from the perspective of a publisher trying to ship the project. Uh, mm -hmm. So for instance, uh, uh, Victoria, uh, our community manager, is uh, promoting the game uh, during the daytime because it, uh, it matches um, Kipbox as well as the publisher. Uh, Tanya, the uh, head of the studio, does a lot of uh, the business-related things related to the Shadow Dial during the daytime because, again, it matches uh, Kipbox as well as a publisher in this scenario and so mm -hmm. forth. And so it's a, it was a very uh, idiosyncratic deal uh, that um, I I would like to reflect on like uh, one side, you know, I fully process uh, everything that's gone up with launch. Um, I but personally, it was quite difficult at points because uh, I, you know, I still needed to finish this. Uh, there was still a significant amount of work um, related to this, uh, mm -hmm. but at the same time, my um, the official duties uh, during the day were to uh, work uh, focus on a different project. Uh, and so, but it ultimately worked out. So, um, you know, can't complain there, I guess. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it by looking at from the outside, it appears to be uh, the product of a of a smoothly run, efficient, like totally clear and above board, uh, sensical uh, production process. So, um, <laughs> good job, congratulations. Well, thank uh, you. <laughs> unlike, so, unlike my decision making process in this game, which is multi layered and confused, now it's fine. Um, I, John Wu, um, as one of Kid Fox Games' co-founders, what do you think is the value of a company putting resources in to release something that might be commercially smaller, uh, but still unique? Like, this game definitely isn't like Kid Fox's other games, but it sort of has its own unique virtues that maybe 
uh, were, were that, that made you all made the decision to publish it, sort of? I mean, I think I might be a biased party uh, in responding to that question because you know so much of my uh, you know personal work goes into that stuff. Right. Uh, but uh, I, I feel though that uh, ultimately. A, as long as like uh, it expands uh, Kitbox's uh, portfolio, uh, expands uh, you know, you know, players' awareness that you know we exist as a company, we make uh, instrument interesting uh, system-focused games. Uh, that's already a win uh, beyond like whatever like uh, like uh, fiscal motivations for uh, releasing a project. I I think it's mostly win as long as the schedule is, uh, works out, and I would. I would think that you know if there were future like personal projects coming out of uh, uh, team members from Kitbox and that uh, they would like to get it uh, published to their company, I would like you know, strongly encourage it as long as again like a production schedule is actually makes sense to do it that way. Yeah, totally. I um I wonder what has been your experience launching a game in 2017 uh, when there are so many games. Uh, in fact, when this game came out, the week this came out, there was a lot of talk going around about there was. You know, three, four, maybe five high-profile uh, indie games, just indie games that they right. released that week. Um, Shrouded Isle has a very distinctive style, has a very distinctive uh, remit. You know, not a lot of not a lot of cult simulator games out there. Um, I mean, how, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did you guys, as you were preparing to launch, how did you how did you think about that? How did you think about when to launch it? How to get the word out? And what you, what it, what returns did you expect uh, in 2017? Uh, so to be completely honest, like as long as the project broke even over time, uh, we were completely happy to release it. Um, as far as the launch window, uh, we tried to avoid uh, uh, like a s- months where like we expect big uh, you know, AAA companies to release, uh, but we didn't. I don't believe that that we were trying to avoid like simultaneous launches with other indies. Let's say. Uh, and, and for the most part, uh, I think we were fortunate in that uh, when, like, uh, on the like last Friday when we launched, uh, we were able to draw attention, presumably due to like the unique concept and art style, and that we stayed at the uh, top of uh, new and trending on Steam for a bit. Um, so I, I, I would imagine we got lucky and we slid in, and uh, to, to some degree, that's like the merits of the project. But to a large extent, uh, you know, I think we also have. Um, just a fortune to bank, I guess. Yeah, uh, that was that, that was a nice change. Normally, when I when I uh, bring out some variant of that question, uh, you know, how do you how do you deal with releasing a game in 2016 or 2017? Yeah. And there's a big intake of breath, and then often a sigh or a yeah, nervous right. laugh. Uh, you seem real even keeled about it, and I wonder, um, like, wh- why is that? Like, are, are you at all concerned about? Um, business as a game developer uh, in like ev- like ever overflowing marketplaces, or do you feel like you guys have found uh, a unique way of staying afloat? I'm not gonna say that uh, what's working for us won't always work, and I'm not gonna say that we're not worried about um, you know business situations in like you know indie game development, right? Uh, but what I will say is that uh, because of the circumstances of the Shrouded Isle and the, the fact that it was. Uh, we never expected to pay a full team of you know six, seven people permanent salary using this project, and that's yeah. not what we invested into this project either. Uh, so that takes a lot of pressure off. Like, a, I mean, it might just be an expectations thing, but I'm pretty happy with the way things turned out here. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I apply that philosophy to my life. Low expectations means uh, just generally more happiness. It's a good way to live. <laughs> uh, but no, that's that's it's cool. I mean, I I don't uh, uh, I I do think Shrouded Isle has a has a really unique premise, and um, you know, we I think we came to it because we know Kit Fox's work, which I think is a, is a good way of getting the word out. But I, you're right, I have noticed it be on Steam. I've noticed it get a little bit of press coverage, which is cool. I wonder, did you give any thought at all to to other forms? Like, did you guys work with YouTubers at all, Twitch at all, or is this really just did, not? Did you work with any cults? Did you find <laughs> any, any cults? cults? I, I can't really talk about that for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but um, uh, as far as the like, YouTubers and uh, like Twitch streaming, uh, uh, Victoria, uh, our community manager, has uh, reached out to uh, um, various streamers, and so like that's definitely been a part of our promotional effort. Nice. I um, I want to know why you can change the villager names. I like that. I didn't see a reason why to, why I do it. But I did it anyway. Why why is that? <laughs> it was uh, one of the. Um, 
earliest uh, feedback for like requested features. Wait, and, people uh, wanted to kill their friends? Well, that, that's the thing. So, like at a conference, right? Uh, so let, let's say like we're showing this at like PAX South or PAX West or wherever, and then like you know a bunch of uh, your friends would come over and like you know they'll like you know get the game essentially. Um, they'll grok it and then they'll yeah actually want to kill their friends. Or uh, from a streamer's perspective, when the streamer would come by, they would ask, hey, uh, you know, like I'd like to reward my uh, audience, uh, uh, my followers by you know like renaming some of the townspeople as them, and then you know presumably kill them at some point. Uh, and, and so it, it was an interesting request, um, but, uh, you know, here we are. Uh, one interesting way I found players use it is to take notes. Uh, so uh, it's like, a, you know, follows orders on uh, Blackborn. Um, it, it becomes a new name of that character because you just want to keep track of them. Huh. Wow. I didn't, <laughs> uh, that's, I didn't think they used that at all. It's a good idea. Um, Let's see, there's a question in the chat that I'm just going to scoop up real quick. Spawn Love asks, did Kit Fox ever consider that the dark or evil subject matter might turn away potential buyers or turn up bad press? Yep. I, don't know. <laughs> I mean, like that, that's the reality of the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, there were two incidents that, that really stressed me out. Uh, so, so the first one was, um, I think when we announced our trailer, um, there were comments on like uh, on a news site uh, that basically took everything about the game at face value. Mm. And so they thought we were like, uh, you know, this is a political message on our part, which, uh, you know, we do not endorse, like, you know, uh, the uh, actual, uh, you know, morals, like uh, moral uh, values of this town as, as a company, you know. Um, but some people took it that way. Um, nothing, no slashback happened as a result of that, but, you know, that was a bit concerning. Uh, the second time was um, when we were showing uh, this game at, uh, in Kuwait uh, uh, for uh, their game expo. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, you know, like uh, the Sheik uh, who was uh, hosting the, like who uh, funded the event was going around and uh, shaking everyone's hand and getting an explanation about the game. And I, I was in the position of having to tell him that, yeah, this is a human sacrifice cult simulator uh, to like one of the most powerful people in that country. Uh, so for sure, it's been a concern for us. Um, but uh, for the most part, the players seem to understand that uh, we are not endorsing the views of the game. Uh, in fact, uh, this might be a critique of, you know, certain organizations that may uh, behave in this manner. Wait, how, wow. did, how did the Sheik take that? Oh, he, he, he thought left the story fantastic. hanging off there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, he thought it was, like, super fresh. Uh, you know, he was really compelled by the concept, so that was a huge relief. He, he, just, he just mimed a chef's kiss and then kept walking. <laughs> uh, what was it like in Kuwait? Like, uh, showing games in Kuwait? Like, how long were you guys there? Did, did you have the game localized at that point, or was it still just in English? Or? It was still in English, um, but uh, we found that um, the audience there is uh, mostly fluent, um, and therefore uh, they were enjoying the game regardless. Um, Kuwait was really great. Uh, we were there for a week. Uh, the, the event itself was about uh, three days or so, but the, the host... Uh, um, yeah, like uh, they uh, uh, gave us lodging and food and such, and that uh, they were amazing hosts for a week. Yeah. Did you get any sense of like what the game scene is like over there, either for players or for developers, or not so much? They, uh, the development scene there is uh, still in its uh, infancy, so to speak. Um, like uh, there are talented people, but um, I, if they organized as a development community, I, I think uh, they will grow very quickly. Um, as far as the players, um, it seems that like a lot of them, um, because um, a lot of the uh, major uh, publishers or uh, platform holders, uh, they don't have a Middle Eastern branch and they're forced to uh, that have American accounts, or they're forced to have other, like you know, Western accounts instead, and uh, so there's a sense of being underserved. There's a sense of, uh, hey, uh, you know, what about us? You know, like there's like millions of us, and yet uh, you know you don't localize to Arabic. And as I say that, I feel a bit embarrassed because the Shadow Owl did not localize to Arabic, although that would be a candidate that for like a feature localization if we were to look at that. Mm. Yeah, but I did notice that it is localized in a number of languages, and I wonder, in that process, did you have to give any thought to the the content of the game at all, like especially for, for places like China, or is it just pretty much just basically the same people kill so, people? So, 
Surprisingly, China is uh, one of our uh, the best regions uh, for like for sales for the game. Uh, the reception mm-hmm. there has been especially great, and uh, I think uh, I think there was a great coverage from I, I forget the exact situation, but there was a lot of attention uh, drawn to the game uh, in China. Mm-hmm. And so, actually, uh, China and Japan did uh, outstanding compared to our, our previous efforts. And so this probably means that we'll continue to uh, localize for uh, East Asia. Good. That's, that's good to hear. And it's surprising. I, do you have any sense at all of why you think it might have done especially well in China? Or is it still just kind of a mystery? Um, I'm going to consult uh, Victoria. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's cool. We'll just hang out here and watch Brian play. Yeah. Oh, dang it. I think I lost. Um, <laughs> I was trying to follow. Wait, should I be on the screen for this? Sure. Hello. Here is Victoria. <laughs> Hi, Victoria. Hi, Victoria. Hello. Um, why we did particularly well in China? Honestly, I'm not too sure. I know that we uh, recently found out that we were like not tweeted because Twitter's not kind of, but uh, basically a big news outlet like wrote about us and it became kind of caught on and got really popular. Um, but yeah, I can't say for sure what happened in China that really made us super popular. Maybe they like sacrificial cults? No? That, that seems unlikely, but we'll go with that idea. <laughs> That's cool. It's, That's good nice. good to hear, though. <laughs> I know, uh, I know uh, developers more and more, uh, I, I'm kind of late to the boat on this, obviously, like developers for, for years now have been looking to China as a, as a new market and, and trying to figure out how to, how to get big in China, how to do well in China. So it's good to hear that sometimes you can just make a game and it does well in China for no understandable reason. That's fantastic. Uh, developers have been trying to get to China for years, and it just works. Yeah, I know. It, I mean, the gaming market there is like increasing like, yeah, so be. fast. Um, uh, now I can hear. Uh, but yeah, it's honestly super surprising. So yeah, maybe we'll probably look into that, and maybe we'll have an answer for you in the future. Well, Victoria, since since you're here with us, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do at KitFox and, and what you did on Try to Dial? Sure. Uh, yeah. So I'm Victoria. I'm the community manager for Kickbox Games. Right. As, of course. As uh, has mentioned, mm-hmm. and for Shredded Eye, I basically was the person that obviously is like taking care of the Twitter, the Facebook, all the social media accounts, but also uh, checking Steam, doing all the updates, and emailing press and YouTubers and streamers okay. to see if they're interested in covering the Shredded Eye. Mm. What's been the trickiest part of like managing the discourse around this game, getting the word out, but not? Not too getting the word out, you know what I mean? Yeah, honestly, it was actually probably making them understand what the game is. It's kind of hard to explain what it is. Like, you'll say, like, oh, it's a, it's a human cult sacrifice management simulator, and they'll still be kind of confused. So it really uh, was about showing them, like, little gifts of gameplay to make them kind of understand it more. Um, but it's definitely not a game you can just talk about and have someone immediately understand what it's about like kind of the gameplay is like nice uh brian as long as we have victoria do you have any community management or uh general marketing questions that we could just throw out um uh victoria when you look at this game uh what do you think makes it what do you think makes it special like why do you think like what have you sort of been using as like the core selling point for people uh well two things so one visually it's striking because it's just such a strange like you don't see uh, monochrome uh, color palettes anymore in games. It's all about the effects and stuff. Um, but second of all, obviously the fact that it is about a cult is something a lot of people I've seen have really attached to because they're like, I saw one comment on Twitter or was it Steam, anyways, but of someone going like, there should be more, there should be like a genre of just cults and <laughs> sacrifices. And I was like, oh, oh wow. I guess, yeah. I so, guess there was an underserved. Yeah, so yeah. there's obviously a niche audience here that the game market is not tapping into, uh, in which we tapped into. So, <laughs> um, Jung Wu, there's a question in the chat that I thought was interesting from a developer side because you were talking about localizing to Arabic oh, earlier. I'll, I'll pass this on to Jung Wu because he can't hear. And Thanks, Victoria. Thank, Thank you, Victoria. Thanks for hanging out. All right, Jung Wu. Hello. Yes, I'm back. back. Um, Hi. Ozpet is working on an Arabic game right now, and they've noticed there's a lot of differences in how the written language chances on a lot of cases. Do you think it would be possible to look, uh, add that in without having to make major changes to how text logic works in your game? 
And so uh, that touches on a bigger question about like, hey, dynamic text in games. So how does it work with localization, right? Even yeah. with the languages in the game right now, I mean, English is so easy. English is so easy by comparison because like, you know, there's no gendered cases. Uh, you know, there's no like special handling for dominant cases, whatever. Um, and so like uh, compared to what I initially had uh, as a core system before uh, the major localization passes, like a lot of changes were made to uh, support the, you know, European languages, support the Japanese, Korean, uh, Chinese. Um, so, I mean, once if we commit to it, we'll just have to deal with it as well. Like, there's just going to have to be special handling. I just want to the, point it real quick, sorry, I'll let you get back to your question. The, the, being a teenager is a minor vice in this oh, game. Oh, yeah. She's I mean, a that, teen. That, oh, my that, God. That, that's true to our world, too. You know? it's just kind of... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a fantastic screenshot where it's like I I'm clicking, I'm I'm making the choice between sacrifice and spare, and her, she's she's like a, she's like an arrogant teen, and I was like, oh oh no, that's just that's just everybody. Yeah, this is just everybody. parenting right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sorry, but I um, have, you, anyway. have you dealt with any cases where localization wound up affecting um, uh, text logic in your game? Oh. Yes, I mean, that was basically uh, my life for the last uh, month or so. <laughs> oh! <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, like, there were a lot of, I mean, so in retrospect, I made a lot of assumptions that I should not have made about, uh, you know, how, like, uh, a text, like, a line of text is displayed in the game, and how easily it would be to switch out. Um, and, but, yeah, like, in a lot of cases, I just basically needed to get the, uh, set up a template that the, uh, the localizer can adjust however they wish. And then, uh, or if that didn't work, there just had to be special handling for that particular language. Right on. Uh, we should probably wind this down. Yeah, we only have we... 10 minutes left. So if you have questions in the chat for Jongwoo, please uh, toss them in so we may ask them. Mm, I'm just going to watch this animation for a second because I don't remember if the sacrificer is gendered or not. I don't think he, I don't think they are, right? Like there's a lot of, you can just sort of, uh, I, I really like the art style in this game. Uh, I think it's super interesting. I feel like we've already mined that that topic for a lot of good questions. Um, but I, I kind of want to know why, like why, why monochrome? Like why, why go with this palette? Is that something you had any influence in, Jungwoo, or was it pure artist? Is it just all up to the artist, and they just went? It was definitely uh, Erica, uh, the art director for, for the project. Uh, she was the one that chose uh, this particular style. Um, there were a lot of circumstances uh, leading up to that. Um, so the game jet that we did was actually, uh, I believe, the ninth or tenth one, like in that year. Um, and so uh, some of those shows she was involved and some of those she weren't, but it wasn't like, you know, like it was something that we were doing regularly. Um, and she wanted to find a style that was uh, both efficient as well as uh, challenging and also, you know, visually like distinctive. And uh, so she's like, okay, so what if I, you know, use very, very strange colors and, you know, and just use those two. Um, let's see what happens. And this happened. It's good. I like it a lot. It's good. Uh, questions we I, we, we kind of wanted to know about maybe how you guys approached your um, the business of releasing this game across multiple platforms. Did you guys? I noticed you're on Steam. Are you on Itch as well? We are on one? Itch. Yes, we are on Itch. So like I, I kind of wonder as we um, as we watch developers uh, sort of spread across platforms as Itch kind of like gets a higher and higher profile. Uh, like. W what what's behind that decision? Like, why why go to both platforms? What what does each one give you as a developer that the other one doesn't? And sort of like, I kind of want to get your perspective on that uh, launch split, if you will. Okay. Um, fundamentally, uh, Steam is still the most important platform for us. Um, but it's always a question of like a effort or like a time or money versus the value of being on that platform. And as much as possible, we want to be on as like many platforms as possible. Uh, in the case of Itch, they make things so easy to just upload a build there. For our DRM free platform, that it is probably the the easiest, the most successful for both the developer as well as the player. Um, so since it took very little effort for us to do it, like it's a question of why not. Some players will just not uh, buy things on Steam because it has DRM by default. Um, that's so that's why we're there. That's why we're on Edge. 
Yeah, uh, I'm a little bit embarrassed. I got to admit. First of all, that's interesting, and I appreciate you sharing that. But there's a question in chat that makes me realize we didn't really touch on an important piece of this game, and we're okay. running out of time. Which is like, uh, as far as I know, it's it's in some part or wholly procedurally generated, right? I mean, like which traits people have and that kind of thing. That's not yeah. fixed. So someone in, in chat, at Spawn Love, is asking in chat, like, how do you feel about the idea that community guides and wikis will inevitably catalog the entire game and do away with some of the exploration and decision making? And I think. That's probably possible, but I think a lot of it is just different every time you play, right? Um, it is. It is somewhat different sometimes. You know, that you, I mean, like obviously, it doesn't have infinite possibilities, right? Mm. And so, like, uh, once a guide is out, and like, once someone mines all the data from the game, sure, some of the magic will be gone. But I think that's just inevitable in a game, like no matter like how procedural uh, their the systems are. And so, I'm at peace with it. Um, I'm. I'm happy if you think you can, you know, catalog everything in the game and how it affects everything in the game. I mean, that might take out the fun for some people, but for other people who really want to maximize things, that's fun in its own way. So, I'm yeah, okay. Sounds good. Uh, am I am I overestimating the amount of procedural? I, I got the impression just again by playing a game or two that uh, the characteristics seem to be randomly assigned, and maybe even the the requirements that you get seem to be randomly assigned. Is that not on point? Is there is there that more? is on point? Okay. Um, so the uh, all the characters and their traits are generated at the start of the playthrough, mm. and the dreams that you encounter and the events that you encounter, um, they're all like randomly selected. The requirements will change uh, dynamically over the uh, over the playthrough. So, um, at the same time, I, mean, I won't claim to have like uh, the complexity that Dwarf Fortress does by like any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> so yeah, it it does seem like. Proc gen or, or some permutation of that uh, approach to game design has become a hallmark of Kid Fox games. Um, I think for the better. Like I think I think it's cool. I think, I think games like this are cool. I think it's cool that, that kind of technology can make games very, um, very uh, interesting and replayable and kind of uh, uh, you know sort of intriguing for a relatively small team. You know. Uh, so I wonder, right. like, um, I guess first of all, have you ever worked on a game that's not in some way procedurally generated or has some some level of that or? Is, Yes, yes, I have. Yeah. yeah. So, w w what is it that uh, appeals to you about that approach versus a more standard, like, uh, for lack of a better word, like uh, content creative, just like putting stuff into the game? I think um, part of it is that the development itself becomes more interesting. Uh, hmm. it, it becomes risky in its own way, but, uh, but it's just interesting to see like uh, things being different while you're actually making them. Uh, so, there's a bit of a selfish desire in that regard. Um, but beyond that, um, there's, I guess, like, yeah, there's like this, like, uh, like a sense of a holy grail in that, you know, if you made a game, should, why is it not infinitely replayable? Hey, why didn't you create an entire world in there? Wait, why mm -hmm. couldn't you do that? And that, so let's say that, you know, we can't create an entire world. Um, but let's say, you know, we can create a piece of that world every time. Uh, if we can do that, why should we not do that? And th there's very good reasons not to, depending on the case. Um, but um, I think that's the mentality and that uh, why shouldn't we like uh, see what possibilities we can create given, you know, these pieces and these ideas? Yeah, I think I think there's some shadow of the joy and satisfaction and, and promise that is in a game like Shrouded Isle in the process of procedurally generating a game, right? Like the idea that if you just tweak the right values and get the right things like lined up and make sure these numbers are, are high enough and these numbers are low enough and, and like you, you can build a perfect game engine that will just produce these worlds without any weird uh, right, right. or mistakes, uh, right. no, no uh, red bars. No red bars, uh, yep, that's the dream um, and you know, if we even like scratch the surface of that dream, I think it's still very interesting. I agree. I think it's neat. Um, Brian, you got any final questions? I don't want to run off here. Uh, I think it's a good time to start wrapping it up. We'll just uh, finish up this season here. Um, thank you, everyone, for watching the Gama Sutra Twitch channel. Um, it's been a delightful time talking with John Wu today. Um, again, the game is The Shrouded Isle, out now on... Uh, Steam and itch.io. Um, I have been Bryant Francis, a contributing editor at Gamma Sutra. Um, and Alex, who have you been? Oh, hi. I've just been Alex Waro, um, an editor at Gamma Sutra. Uh, and we've been joined by two very special guests. One of them's already gone, but Zhang Wu, who have you been, and where could people uh, catch up with you if they want to follow your work? 
Um, so I'm John Wu. Uh, I'm a co-founder at Kitbox Games. And uh, so if you want to follow us at Kitbox Games on Twitter, or at, if you want to look up the Shrider Dial on Steam or HIO, please, uh, you know, we'd be happy to uh, hear from you. Nice. All, all right. right. Uh, and with, Brian, can you can you do all the things? Yeah. I'm, I'm just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. While you're at it, right. if you could please follow the uh, follow the Gamma Twitch channel, we would appreciate it. Um, I'm going to. Uh... Ooh, this is bad. You're not killing the embezzler. I mean, why would you not kill the embezzler? Because they're. Oh, I guess they'll be dissatisfied. Yeah, it's a good time to kill her. All right. Well, I'll kill her and then get out. That's a good way to end okay. the show. All right, everyone, follow right. the Gamma Sutra Twitch channel. Uh, she's going to die. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.